Welcome viewers at home. My name is Arjon Dunnewind. I'm your host tonight in this event with Yevgeny Morozov in search of digital agency. Um, we're very happy to have you here in the new impact portal, planet.impact.nl. And planet.impact.nl is the portal in which, we'll be, in which we will be organizing our live online events uh, in the upcoming time. Um, so all the events like this one, Impact TV and, and, and uh, events like that, you can find it uh, in um, planet.impact.nl. Um, Tonight's uh, event um, will be with Yevgeny Morozov. First, we'll have a short introduction with Yevgeny in a few seconds. Um, I will explain a bit the web project uh, that this uh, talk is connected with. Uh, and after Yevgeny's talk, um, we will be having a short interview and a Q&A with you as our audience. So please uh, think of any questions, share your questions or maybe just your remarks. Share them with us at questions.impact. .nl, and we again will share them in the uh, in the broadcast with Yevgeny. Um, so before we welcome uh, Yevgeny, I'm going to talk a little bit about We Are Data, which is a web project that this uh, event tonight and Yevgeny's lecture is connected with. Uh, we Are Data is a project that we started a year ago together with Cairo Tronica, an Egyptian media arts festival, uh, and we invited uh, six Egyptian artists as fellows to participate in this program uh, with workshops. And um, here, I hope, yeah, you can see the Egyptian artists that participated in the project. And together with three uh, Dutch artists, um, they have been doing uh, collaborations in the form of workshops. Um, and these uh, three Dutch artists, Sabrina Verhagen, Jeroen van Loon and Coralie Vogelaar, went to um, uh, Cairo several times um, to help uh, and engage with the uh, Egyptian artists uh, in the process of the artworks that they have been making. These artworks have been presented at the Cairo Tronica Festival a few weeks ago. Uh, and um, another component of the web project is connected to tonight's event, actually. And that's the talks that we have been organizing and that we will be organizing in the future of international experts uh, connected to uh, We Are Data, this project in which we are researching the importance of information and access to information in our society, but also uh, the data economy uh, that we find ourselves in and data becoming a commodity, data the new gold, so to say. And we've invited several speakers uh, to talk about that. And uh, among these speakers, as you can see, here is uh, tonight's guest, Yevgeny Morozov. So please, uh, let's welcome Yevgeny Morozov for a short introduction. Uh, Yevgeny, um, I hope you can hear us, you're here with us. Um, yeah, uh, as I understand it, you're at the moment in the south of Italy. Uh, I guess you're working on several uh, projects. Maybe uh, um, introduce us to um, uh, what you're doing at this moment before uh, we're going to watch the pre-recorded uh, lecture that you made for us, and after that, of course, the Q&A and the interview. Uh, but please um, tell us uh, what you're working on at this moment. Sure. Well, I've uh, isolated myself here uh, probably almost since the beginning of the pandemic, but actually much before that. So I've, I, I've joked that the world finally caught up with my lifestyle because I've been living in this uh, tiny Calabrian village, isolated, working on my books and on the syllabus project, which is a very ambitious curatorial effort to kind of show that a very different uh, internet uh, is possible. Uh, but ultimately, I've been trying to um, re-examine some of the early critiques I've been making of technological autonomy Openism and technological solutionism, and also try to articulate maybe what an alternative uh, um, paradigm that would not be technophobic uh, be like. So mm -hmm. what is it that we can do with this fantastic digital infrastructures that are now at our disposal that wouldn't default us into accepting, uh, uh, you know, everything that Silicon Valley gives us, but it also wouldn't force us into this dystopian view painted by critics of surveillance capitalism. And so that will be the subject of my next book. And, you know, you will hear more about it in, in the lecture. Yeah. So your lecture called In Search of Digital Agency. Uh, it's about 40 minutes long. Let's watch it. You've pre-recorded it for us. And after 40 minutes, we'll be back with you for the Q&A. Uh, also, our audience, please uh, share your concerns, your questions, your remarks with us at questions at impact.com. 
Dodanel. We'll pass them on and discuss them with Yevgeny. Um, but first, let's watch your lecture. Thanks, Yevgeny. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I wish, like, I guess, uh, many other speakers that I could have been with you in person. But of course, it's still too early for this kind of luxury of in-person communication. So perhaps uh, that will have to wait until we're through with this pandemic. But uh, nonetheless, I hope that my talk will give you some food for thought and that eventually, um, perhaps uh, in some of the next editions, uh, I'll be able to join you uh, physically. So um, I've been asked to reflect a little bit in my talk uh, about how we can regain and reconquer uh, agency and uh, autonomy in this age which uh, some describe as digital or cyber or technological uh, and you know we, we don't need to get hung up on the definitions but i think it's important to understand that we are talking about um, a qualitatively different environment in which our democratic and political aspirations uh, take hold an environment where uh, networks uh, data intensive infrastructures uh, sensors are ubiquitous, uh, they are omnipresent, uh, they're cheap to use, and they're gathering all sorts of data, uh, of course, is bound to have uh, vast uh, political effects. So uh, rethinking what agency and autonomy mean in such an environment, I think, is one of the most uh, fundamental and crucial projects and tasks for uh, any progressive force uh, at work today. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, our debate about this uh, has been shaped by uh, the usual dichotomy of, uh, you know, you can call it cyber pessimism of some kind of cyber optimism. Uh, you know, I've been studying uh, what I have dubbed uh, techno utopianism already 12 or 13 actually years ago. I've been studying it for a while, right? And my uh, reflection uh, has been that it tends to move in cycles that, of course, in the 1990s and the early 2000s, uh, we've been at the peak um, and at the height of this uh, rather naive cyber utopianism, which was all about the new economy. It was all about this frictionless society that was emerging, but that was pretty much before Web 2.0, and it was pretty much before Silicon Valley acquired uh, the cultural and political force uh, that it holds now. Then uh, that cyber utopianism shifted into a more political and even geopolitical dimension. And you probably all remember the palpable excitement around the years 2000. 2010, 2011, when the wave of protests in the uh, Middle East, the so-called Arab Spring, was supposedly fueled by social media. And back then, of course, everybody was, uh, almost everybody, uh, was convinced that uh, significant changes were afoot and that essentially the world will be transformed through social media. Right? And what is so, and that, of course, was also the time when uh, we all thought that uh, a new form of agency uh, powered by this openly capitalist systems and platforms, but nonetheless platforms with vast implications for freedom and democracy, uh, we saw that that new kind of agency was emerging, right? So I, I think we should be quite honest to ourselves about it, that we were wrong, but we were also wrong to frame this question um, without critically um, looking at the highly specific capitalist nature of those platforms, right? We couldn't just expect the likes of Google or Facebook or Twitter to be uh, the faithful ambassadors and promoters of democracy, if you will. But what is interesting, uh, and you know, I can't give you a whole kind of historical excourse here, but I will, I will walk you through it very quickly. What is interesting is that uh, a couple of years later, after this initial enthusiasm about the Arab Spring uh, deflated, uh, what we have seen was the almost opposite um, effect, right? We've seen the almost opposite um, attitude emerge uh, in the public sphere where it was those very platforms that were suddenly seen 
as responsible for suppressing agency, right? They were seen as forces conducive to manipulation, to misinformation, to essentially uh, spreading fake news, you know, and I've chosen probably the most appropriate uh, t-shirt I could wear uh, on this occasion. And that, of course, all culminated in our uh, frustrations and fears around the time of Brexit and Donald Trump's election, where um, the general public and the commentariat, they almost swung to the opposite conclusion that social media, as they uh, worked at the time, were key to suppressing the actual democratic aspirations of ordinary citizens and all sorts of dark forces, including, by the way, all sorts of authoritarian governments that were supposed to be undermined by social media, but somehow uh, were still standing, were increasingly using these very tools and platforms uh, to uh, manipulate and shape public opinion. And I would argue that it's within that context that uh, this very dark view uh, that now we would refer to as, you know, this critique of the digital economy as surveillance capitalism emerges, right? And it's the idea that uh, our agency in this digital uh, environment is essentially a figment of our imagination. We don't have any. Our behavior is studied, uh, it's thoroughly analyzed, uh, it's optimized, and there are all sorts of mechanisms in place uh, in order to essentially steer us towards goals, objectives, products, ads, that are favorable to uh, the digital firms running the platforms, right? And this idea that <clears throat> we have moved from this very promising utopian web where uh, everybody was the king uh, of their own little corner of cyberspace to a very different web where all of our actions were predetermined and pre-shaped and it was just about extracting data from us, um, that I would argue is a very stark uh, change, right? And how we think of agency, but also in terms of how we think of solutions. Uh, and this perhaps is the most puzzling bit of this uh, theory of surveillance capitalism, where if you look at it closely, it doesn't actually offer anything uh, of substance to put in place of the surveillance capitalist regime other than perhaps a somewhat different type of information capitalism that will not be like Google and it will not be like Facebook, but it will be more like Apple, meaning that they will pay lip service to privacy, they will sell us expensive gadgets, and it will be through those gadgets that we would be realizing ourselves. And in that, it's kind of a very um, strange, uh, and I would actually argue an extremely utopian uh, project in that it still maintains this faith uh, in our ability as consumers to realize ourselves in the marketplace as long as our needs and desires are actually genuine, right? So it still puts a lot of hope uh, in the idea of genuine self-expression through market relations. Uh, and in that, it uh, kind of doesn't actually offer us any critical reading, even of Apple itself, which is, you know, has a carefully cultivated image or as being somehow on the cutting edge of counterculture with something that uh, Steve Jobs uh, cultivated uh, over decades and, you know, analyzed properly through some kind of critical marketing and branding lens. Apple itself emerges as just one of those mirages, as one of those sort of utopian longings of modernity, which is actually as in genuine and inauthentic as this manufactured desires that Facebook or Google uh, produces through surveillance capitalism, right? I'm uh, spending so much time talking about surveillance capitalism because I think it kind of shows the dead end where a certain brand of digital critique uh, has led us. Uh, so, you know, after a decade, uh, it's obvious that we require thinking on new terms, we require new concepts, and we require new views of agency that manages to break through uh, the uh, limits and the constraints that have been imposed on our imagination uh, through the period of the Cold War. And I would argue that we have still underestimated just how much 
our imagination and how much our kind of mental and political categories are still shaped by the political, historical, intellectual legacy of the Cold War, where we're still forced to choose either between self-realization of our agency in the marketplace or surrendering ourselves to the highly inefficient system of central planning that uh, might save us of Google, but will probably put us in a gulag to sort of uh, make a cheap joke, right? I mean, that's essentially the choice that uh, is presented, I would argue, by uh, the second camp uh, in this debate, which, uh, you know, unlike people worried about surveillance capitalism, um, doesn't actually see much uh, wrong with Google or Facebook, and instead, it insists on the fact that um, if only we use this information technologies wisely, we would be able to build a world that's much more efficient, um, that's much more responsive to the needs of actual consumers, and that will offer us uh, constantly falling costs uh, of products, so things will become accessible, and we will see actually a revolution in social mobility of some kind, and people who have been previously excluded from consuming high-end luxurious products will finally be able to get access to them. I would point you to the writings of uh, Hal Varian, for example, a very prominent uh, economist who also happens to be the chief economist of Google, who played a fundamental role in designing um, the auctions through which Google uh, sells its ads. And it's in Hal Varian that we find this idea that, uh, you know, basically uh, the middle and lower classes today, by thanks to information technology, acquire things that the upper classes and the richer classes had 10 years ago, but they uh, have it in a somewhat different form, right? So if um, 10 years ago, let's say, uh, the executives of big firms or rich people in general had personal drivers or they had personal maids or they had servants. Today, uh, such functions would be available through self-driving cars or they would be available through personal assistants like Alexa or Siri or, for that matter, Google Assistant. And many of these needs and aspirations that previously could not have been met can actually be met uh, by means of technology, right? And there is this idea that it's by essentially making capitalism and especially this new kind of digital and informational capitalism more ubiquitous, more comprehensive, uh, more widespread, that we would be able to enhance the agency of people because instead of sort of... Uh, having them act through institutions or through some kind of, um, well, hiring support, right, babysitters and whatnot, they would be able to rely on existing technology to basically make uh, spaces uh, and time slots in their life for their own personal pursuits, thus enhancing agency further, right? And of course, on the neoliberal end of the spectrum, I would call them neoliberalism, just to sort of simplify things, even though this is not exactly uh, a well-defined uh, or precise term. On the neoliberal end of the spectrum, you know, this of course also culminates in the idea that we can design markets uh, by using information technology to redistribute resources um, uh, more efficiently and thus, again, make things more accessible, uh, especially to people who could not afford them before. Uh, in theory, of course, this translates into justifying activities of companies like Airbnb or Uber that claim that by using sensors and algorithms and networks of all kinds, they manage to uh, optimize the use of resources uh, in a way that's more sustainable, that doesn't waste resources, and that essentially uh, brings cost savings to consumers. Uh, in reality, of course, the picture is much more complex, and uh, we can't really know whether the cheaper costs of taking an Uber car as opposed to a normal taxi come from this uh, tremendous efficiencies uh, enabled through information technology or whether they are just the consequence of sovereign wealth fund of Saudi Arabia uh, being or SoftBank, for example, one of the big funders in this space.
companies uh, being uh, capable of sustaining uh, many, many years of multi-billion losses, uh, thus subsidizing the trips and travels of uh, vast chunks of the world population in order to crash their competition, conquer the market, and then squeeze whatever efficiencies they can by either uh, driving up the prices uh, or by essentially automating everything and thus getting rid of drivers in Uber cars to begin with. Now, so that's a controversial subject, but you see that there is um, some kind of uh, a promise, right, which emerges uh, in this uh, very, um, I would argue, pro-big tech conception of how the world and the economy works, right? And that this idea that information and digitization broadly stated means markets uh, and more efficient markets and the more markets, the better because it's only through the markets that we can deliver on the underlying promises of what I would call modernity, right? So things related to autonomy, uh, the sense of becoming discovery, uh, of both uh, wants and needs and processes and techniques, you know, so we can discover all of them if only have more markets and more competition and information is the way to go. And of course, the view of agency that emerges on this conception, uh, it's a very peculiar one, but what is interesting is that even though some of the initial theoretical defenders right, of uh, the neoliberal dogma, so people like Friedrich Hayek, they will explicitly tell you, if you were to press them about these issues in the 70s, for example, whether there is also some compromise, some, uh, and compromise I don't mean in a good sense, but whether there is also some um, sort of uh, trade-off uh, whereby we need to accept some compulsion, we need to accept some uh, 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 constraints on our freedom, whether all these things are involved in giving us this market-driven freedom, they will, of course, acknowledge that, yes, that's the case. And, you know, and Hayek openly tells you that the reason uh, that competition works is because it relies on what he calls impersonal compulsion, that essentially firms competing with each other to offer cheaper products and invent new things, they generate consequences that their employees, that their customers, that their their uh, founders have to accept, right? That it's not up to any of them to determine the path uh, in which a given firm or a given product or a given uh, you know, uh, job would develop. Uh, that in itself is a function of competition, which is unpredictable. And uh, it's possible that you will lose your job or you will not be able to enjoy the product you've always loved because they will essentially be out of business uh, because somebody would invent a technique that would be much faster and uh, much cheaper than the one that you've been using. And in that sense, um, even the compulsion of this model is justified because we are told that, okay, there is some compulsion and there are some costs and we have to accept them, but ultimately it would enhance our agency down the road because it will open up access to products that are cheaper. It will open up access to more of them. So some compromise in terms of agency, it's fine, right? We can feel some constraints. Uh, we can actually be told to do things we don't want to do because ultimately that's the cost of progress. And I would argue that um, by and large, again, emerging uh, from this Cold War uh, environment, where uh, to some extent uh, we've been brainwashed into thinking that the only way to go is by organizing our affairs through markets, because central planning as such leads to dictatorship, it leads to uh, the gulag, you know, it leads to all the bad things about which we were scared uh, to death in the media and in academia and in books and whatnot. We, we are kind of trained to accept uh, this choice that, you know, we either are stuck uh, sort of celebrating Apple as the good informational capitalists that don't uh, uh, shape our behavior and don't engage in manipulating our wants and needs. So we become critics of surveillance capitalism. Uh, and maybe, you know, which is, has also become fashionable, we become critics of the immense um, competitive power, well, of, of the immense market power of big tax. So we might also argue that these firms need to be broken up, etc. But that's not because 
they influence our agency, that's because they influence our political process, right? So we are, we are allowed uh, to be critical of them, but we still hold on to the idea that the only way to deliver on the uh, emancipatory promises of information technologies is through the market. So what we want is more apples, but apples meaning more, more firms like Apple, but maybe Apple that doesn't abuse its market power when it sets prices in its app store, right? But when it comes to everything else, the courageous stance that it has recently taken against Facebook, you know, the way in which it claims to defend the privacy of its users, all of that is to be celebrated. And it's only in that sphere of non-surveillance informational capitalism, as somebody like Shoshana Zubov would put it, that we can essentially seek the answer to the problems of modernity, right? And just to sum up this kind of dichotomy I've been drawing, or the alternative view is that, okay, this is not really a problem, and perhaps some shaping of behavior is inevitable, perhaps most of the shaping is ineffective and most of this advertising doesn't work. Uh, it's true that uh, disruption, uh, so to say, comes with costs, but, uh, you know, as Lenin supposedly once said, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. So you do need to break some eggs and you do need to suffer some costs and consequences of this disruption in order for technological progress to bring all these goods and share them with the rest of society, right? And that's why we need the market and we need to design better markets. We need to design more informational superior markets, etc. So you kind of, we are stuck between this, um, uh, rejection of surveillance capitalism, but endorsement of information capitalism as a whole, or we are stuck with kind of uh, a rejection of the critique of surveillance capitalism and a full embrace of uh, capitalism as such and uh, capitalism especially that becomes smarter and more efficient by means of information technologies. Now, um, I would argue that, of course, to present central planning as an answer in this case would not necessarily be a smart move by anybody in the progressive forces, even though some people have tried. And I think there are uh, uses for central planning in the kind of alternative universe, uh, which I'm trying to articulate in the book that I'm finishing right now. Uh, I wouldn't go into maybe outlining uh, everything uh, that I have to say about central planning, but let me just tell you that there was a certain um, uh, theoretical mistake that we've made when we've accepted this dichotomy uh, inherited from the Cold War as a valid way to think about organizing society. Now, what I mean by this is the following. Um, for much of the existence, let's say, of the Soviet Union, so from the early 1920s onwards, uh, the left and the right were uh, kind of uh, stuck in what has become known as the socialist calculation debate, where, uh, you know, the socialists were saying, well, by using some kind of a planning mechanism, by using a central planning board that will set the quotas or production outputs, or by relying maybe even on some limited forms of market socialism, we would be able to organize society in a way that would avoid all the rationality of capitalist competition. All right, so that was the position of socialists. And many people defended it in various ways with various variations, you know, from Otto Neurath to um, Oscar Lange to, you know, plenty of people uh, nowadays pointing to the fact that Amazon and Walmart plan, so central planning must be viable, which has certain theoretical flaws uh, in that argument. Uh, on the other hand, of course, always stood neoliberal economists like Hayek and Mises uh, and uh, Robbins and many others who were essentially arguing, and Buchanan, I can also, we can also add to that list, uh, who were always arguing that uh, there is something about markets that central planners would not be able to replicate. And it's a very long story, and to cut it short, you know, the kind of standard consensus uh, that uh, emerges uh, with many of the interventions that Hayek makes uh, between mid-1930s and mid 19 40s, but then also in 1960s, is that markets um, are essentially... Um, here that are competing interpretation, I'll give you mine, that markets essentially manage to utilize uh, knowledge uh, in a way that central planners would not be in order to coordinate action uh, 
between entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs and consumers. That essentially where central planners would need to go and gather knowledge about prices of inputs, changing prices of inputs, uh, and then readjust all the production quarters and all of that will need to be done explicitly and deliberately. Uh, in the market economy, that happens uh, either spontaneously or it doesn't happen at all, meaning that there is no explicit effort to go and find those things out. Somehow this coordination happens spontaneously on its own. Right? And there are people who then develop this idea into thinking that markets are like computers, they are superior at processing information, etc. But if you read higher closely, what you see is that he actually argues something very different. He argues that markets don't actually need to compute any of that uh, because they allow market participants to compute things sort of in their hand, in their head, and then adjust their behavior individually. What I want to say is the following. Uh, whether this position is right or wrong, what I think has been genuinely missing, especially on the progressive side of things, is the realization that the focus that the neoliberals make on social coordination uh, under conditions of knowledge that either doesn't exist or is distributed in society, and the way in which the social coordination then leads to the discovery of new techniques of production, of new uh, needs, of new wants, of new ways of doing things, of new skills, and all of this can be found in Hayek and Mises, this is not a bad focus. Right? We want genuinely as a society, right, as a society concerned with some kind of progressive values, autonomy, agency, democracy, and so on, we genuinely want to get an answer to the question of how can millions of people, associations, and citizen groups uh, who might not know each other engage in complex collective projects that would unleash right? Uh, tons of new practices, tons of new skills that will somehow unearth techniques of doing things, whether it's learning a foreign language or cleaning up a street or sharing a box of films or something else, in a way that will enhance collective learning process, that will enhance our ability to tackle problems together as a society, that will enhance our ability to fight climate change and so forth. Right? This is not um, a bad set of questions for a society to tackle. Now, of course, the reason why the initial progressive and socialist participants in the social calculation debate paid so much attention to central planning was because they were solving a very different problem. They were trying to understand uh, how you can organize production and distribution in such a way as to satisfy the basic needs of society. Uh, and uh, what, uh, that, of course, doesn't uh, necessarily open you to the questions of discovery of all these new things, of new ways of living together, of new forms of life, and new ways of you know becoming an autonomy. Right? It's a very different project. But I would argue that that project is something that socialists cannot, and progressives, if you will, they cannot just leave it to chance. Right? That we have to pay on the progressive side of things as much time uh, as the neoliberals have done to thinking about infrastructures and institutional arrangements through which such acts of collective learning, discovery, and becoming can be institutionalized and can, in a sense, be made available almost as a service, you know, to people, to participants, and to everyone, but of course not as a billable service the way Amazon or Google would offer it, but the way we would offer a library service where, you know, we basically, if you think about the library as an institution, it's quite counterintuitive and even revolutionary, right, in terms of what it does. It's uh, the result of society uh, collectively and consciously deciding that certain provisions of copyright law have to be suspended so that uh, people collectively uh, can uh, consume or engage with knowledge as a public good. Right? And there will be a funding mechanism attached to it. It will be linked and funded through taxes. And this tax-based system would eventually allow us to 
uh, achieve a social goal that still in this even market neoliberal times we find rather laudable uh, and uh, attractive. Right? And I would argue that this example of the library should make us aware and should open up our imagination to thinking about what is it that we can do about digital infrastructures, digital platforms, sensors, you know, and all of this uh, kind of uh, infrastructures that are emerging, right, that are currently emerging to serve the need of building these boutique markets everywhere that I was describing at the beginning of my talk, but which could be serving an extremely different function, right? This function can uh, be very different in nature. It doesn't have to be tied to markets. It can be a way of essentially enabling uh, behaviors and acts that are driven not by competition and not by self-interest, by, by solidarity or altruism, right? There is absolutely nothing that should convince us that competition is the only discovery procedure. And here, of course, I'm referring to a very famous essay that Hayek wrote, uh, he, uh, well, he gave it as a talk and then published in um, late 1960s, where he did present competition uh, as a discovery procedure for all the reasons I've outlined before, that it forces companies to compete and they have to discover better and newer ways of doing things. And essentially, they utilize knowledge that they couldn't utilize before. And it's this kind of external pressure that uh, produces things that then get added to the stock of human knowledge and that basically gets transformed into uh, you know, important uh, elements of human civilization. Uh, we clearly should be able to show, because I think that's ultimately uh, the case and it's an accurate description of reality, that there are other discovery procedures, right? That solidarity or altruism are also discovery procedures, but what we are lacking currently are institutions and infrastructures that are as sophisticated and as well-funded and as robust as those of the market economy to essentially unleash them, right? So, of course, if we have built the last, if we have spent the last 30 or 40 years uh, building laws, meaning legal infrastructures, technological infrastructures, economic infrastructures, cultural infrastructures, so as to cement the role of the market as a way of coordinating social activity, as a way of discovering how to live together, as a way of discovering new techniques, it's obvious that we will become accustomed to the idea that other forms of being or discovery or becoming autonomy are impossible. And that the only value that can bring them into existence is self-interest. And that more or less is the short summary of the neoliberal ideology and practice uh, in the last, you know, 40 years. But it clearly doesn't have to be the case. And the only reason why it seems semi-plausible uh, if you read somebody like Hayek is because underneath their defense of neoliberalism is a prior assumption that essentially altruism and solidarity are features of primitive and tribal societies. That sophisticated uh, groups of people, that sophisticated, you know, sophisticated collectives, if you will, uh, once they move to a certain level of sophistication, once people move from villages and tribes to the cities and neighborhoods, uh, they become uh, self selfish. Right? They abandon all this tribal stuff, which is no longer needed in the city, and they realize themselves in the marketplace. Um, everything we know about uh, evolutionary theory and anthropology suggests that this is just a flawed conception of the human. That's just a flawed conception of how we are and that solidarity and altruism are not just some kind of atavistic features on the way out, but that they're actually constitutive of the human behavior. What we are lacking are the kinds of institutions, the kinds of infrastructures that would allow us to act upon them and to turn them, uh, you know, to turn these motivations, if you will, into something that can... Um, help us build robust ways of coordinating our activities, right? Just think about how much um, we actually do in our everyday life 
that is not in any way motivated by selfishness or desire to earn profits. You know, most of our interactions with each other, with our friends, with our family, with our neighbors are motivated and informed by sets of motivations that have nothing to do with selfishness. Uh, when we decide whether we or our partner would go and pick up kids, you know, from the kindergarten, we do not organize an auction uh, and we don't place bids on who will pay what to go and pick up the kids, right? There is a very different procedure in place. We somehow navigate this terrain and uh, this works, right? So this social coordination happens. Uh, and, you know, I would argue that beyond these trivial examples, there are plenty of other uh, uh, um, instances in our everyday life where we not only engage in acts of uh, solidarity and altruism, but we will also engage in acts of creativity and discovery uh, that have nothing to do with our desire to create a startup or to create uh, some kind of profitable commodity or service that will then be sold, right? We uh, encounter problems in our everyday life and we try to solve them. The problem in our current society and in our current economic system as it exists now is that most of those solutions, they die a quick death, meaning that the current legal and economic and technological infrastructures that we have in place, they do not in any way favor the sharing and the scaling up of these individual solutions to the problems that we encounter, right? So if I learn, for example, I learn a lot of languages, uh, so I learned Mandarin for the last, you know, I've been learning it for the last two years or something, and, uh, you know, in the course of learning Mandarin on a daily basis, I constantly invent new techniques of studying it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a big challenge, and when you encounter it right Regularly, you clearly want to do it as best as you can because you have a limited amount of time. And I invent all these techniques, but ultimately, what are currently the options facing me as a creative being? I can become an entrepreneur the way you know Hayek would want me to. I can raise some money, I can form a startup, I can create an app, and I can start char charging for these uh, innovations I've invented. That's a path available maybe to 0.0001% of everyone involved. Most people wouldn't bother because they wouldn't have access to the funds or they just think that their innovations are trivial enough and they're not worth it. So the majority of us, uh, despite being extremely creative in our everyday existence, we kind of uh, use these innovations for ourselves and then they die inside of us, right? And that seems to me such a waste because this is precisely what opens up the space for all this solution is tech that then by means of apps is pushed down our throats and we kind of are forced to use without being able to modify or engage with it in any, in any manner. Imagine if we manage to build an economy uh, and uh, to go with it, if we manage to build technological and legal infrastructures that would actually make the scaling up of such little everyday discoveries, whether they're driven by just uh, desire to save time or by desire to help others or by altruism or by solidarity, if you manage to build a system that will be as productive, right? of value, which will not be capitalist value, as the current system that exists for entrepreneurs, right? Where, you know, if you are a startup and if you are uh, agreeing to play by the rules of the startup game and if you're eager to raise funds and if you're eager to do everything, then certain doors open up in front of you, right? But certain doors also close, right? And I think this is where we need to understand that this uh, wonderful utopian picture that the defenders of the neoliberal model that celebrates this boutique informational markets everywhere, uh, this, this utopia that they advocate, it's essentially rather restrictive in what it can deliver. Because uh, even as a startup, uh, you are almost by default, almost always forced into a certain, uh, you know, institutional jacket, straight jacket, if you will, right? So, you know, once uh, you've decided 
to, to tackle a problem uh, in that way, you have to accept certain practices. You have to accept collection of data, monitoring of data, advertising, selling of subscriptions, etc. You're basically, your hands are tied, right? And if we try to universalize this model, as many people in Silicon Valley want to do, whereby, you know, every single problem from fighting climate change to inequality to hunger in Africa becomes just something that a startup in Silicon Valley can optimize, you know, this is what a decade ago I referred to a solutionism, you can basically see how, despite having access to a lot of technology and a lot of money, both the institutional and the sort of mental imagination with which this model operates, it's rather limited and it's rather blocked. So it's a repertoire of actions. It's limited because there is only as many things you can do if your ultimate uh, goal is to be able to pay off the money you borrowed from venture capitalists, right? Because it will impose certain actions on you even though you think you are as free as you can be as an entrepreneur that's just simply not true so what i think we need to be building alternatively and this is what will, will greatly enhance the agency of consumers who will not be imagined as consumers but of creators and of basically citizens is a set of technological but also legal and economic infrastructures that will allow us to essentially scale up this acts of everyday rebellion against the dominance of the market logic and the dominance of selfishness. If we manage to essentially leverage this everyday acts of rebellion that all of us are participating in, and if we manage to make them productive of value, if they're not just you know rebellion for the sake of rebellion, but if they actually manage to contribute something to building an alternative paradigm in which uh, social coordination and collective action can take place, we would actually be moving one step towards uh, a system where no obvious compulsion takes place, where we are not forced to accept the consequences of technological disruption as inevitable. We would be able to steer technologies and technological infrastructures towards directions that will genuinely be supportive of human becoming and autonomy, and where would argue each of us would feel much more at ease because it will not just be our kind of mental and physical capacity as entrepreneurs that would be developed, but our entire human personality with all of its complexity and all of its dimensions. So thank you very much. And I hope that I've managed to convince you that there is a world beyond this dark view, uh, which is painted through the critique of surveillance capitalism. But I've also convinced you that there is more for us to choose from than just the model of the market market that's preached by the neoliberal economists and advocates. Uh, so I hope we then can engage in a uh, productive uh, Q&A afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Yevgeny. Um, that's a lot of food for thought, uh, but also I would say food for discussion. And that's a discussion we uh, also hope to have with our uh, viewers at home. Uh, so please share your questions with us at questions at impact, uh, .nl. Um, and I have prepared uh, a few uh, questions already. And uh, my first question, I would like to start with uh, a short trip down memory lane. Um, and looking back at the presentation, Jeff Gainey, that you gave earlier in Utrecht at the Impact Festival in uh, 2015, you gave an opening keynote uh, at the Impact Festival with a sharp analysis of the state of technology and digital FIS. Sharp, but also very dark, I would say. And uh, most of our audience went home quite depressed. And in 2018, in your lecture, you analyzed the economic, economic and financial powers behind technical, technological in innovations with uh, SoftBank that you also referred to in your lecture today as one of the most important ones. You pointed out the powers these institutions have and the fact that they operate outside of any democratic control. Uh, and many people were always uh, happy to see you uh, at Impact, but remarks that I often got is, uh, but he is so dark and pessimistic. Uh, now we're here in 2021 and you seem to have become maybe a different person, much more optimistic, I would say, sharing with us the importance of the acts of everyday rebellion and offer us bright alternatives that put solidarity and altruism central. Um, and you ask us to imagine a world behind the views of platform capitalism. So maybe my first and opening question is, uh, what happened to you in the past few years that made you more optimistic? 
Um, I think it's an interesting um, analysis of sort of my trajectory, but I think what really has happened is that uh, I've become much more political in my thinking. And by that I mean that technology as such doesn't really play much of a role in how I think uh, about the world. Meaning that, of course, there is Facebook and Google and Uber and Airbnb, but you know, and they, there are infrastructures behind them. But by and large, uh, these infrastructures as they exist today, they represent a certain political project. And that project is that of turning us into entrepreneurs, so making everything more efficient, or squeezing out more returns from every single digital asset that you have. And clearly, uh, you could not be rebelling against uh, uh, these platforms and technologies, qua technologies, you have to be rebelling against their logic. Uh, but even if you rebel against the logic that they represent, this financialized logic that I've been describing in my lecture, uh, it's obvious that uh, the alternative to it would not be some kind of a world with no technology or a world where, you know, we will be taking, uh, I don't know, old buses instead of Uber cars, but it will be a world that will have a different logic uh, at its core. It will be a logic that is much more conducive to human being and human flourishing and becoming and discovery. And I think having Having uh, reframed my initial questions in that light, it became obvious that uh, you know we've spent too much time um, focusing on technologies and analyzing whether they live up to their promises, whether these technology companies really do what they promise. I mean, that is an important part of what we should be doing, but I think it's much more important to articulate what a counter logic would be. And that counter logic cannot just be the logic of some kind of, you know, liberal bourgeois democratic state that even Hegel would recognize. So it cannot be just about protecting privacy or data or making sure that markets are more competitive. I mean, that's not a bad thing, but it's not enough. And uh, having understood that there is this vast vacuum that's completely uh, unfilled by most of contemporary thought, yeah, I became somewhat optimistic about both feeling it, but also about what uh, at least can be done if only we start analyzing the logic and not just the instantiations of those logic and actual companies and infrastructures. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean that this fight will be easy, right? So mm -hmm. I don't want to give any misleading impression that this is just a matter of somehow uh, adopting a different idea, a different ideology, and all of a sudden those things will come into place. It's not about waking up and uh, preaching to the gods of solidarity instead of the gods of entrepreneurship. It requires different laws, different infrastructures, different political forces. So I'm not underestimating how much work will be involved. But to me, at least, it's a hopeful sign that we know what needs to be done. And it's not just uh, central planning. And it's not just the protection of privacy. So there is some kind of a ray of light on the horizon. So in that sense, yes, I'm a bit optimistic. Mm -hmm. And so you're offering this alternative or suggesting this alternative of a system with institutions and uh, infrastructures based on uh, motivations like altruism and solidarity. Uh, um, first. I've got two questions maybe. Um, how would you call that system? I mean, if you really want to push that agenda, it has uh, made, maybe you have to have a, a catchy name. And I was, is it a favor economy? Is it uh, the sympathy system? And how would you, how would you like, um, how would that system be implemented? On, on which political level, on what social level? Um, maybe you can respond to those two questions. Sure. So a lot of this uh, details, you know, they, they are to be provided in the book, which has which is not finished yet. So we'll give you sort of broad outlines. With regards to the name, I think, uh, you know, for a long time I thought, uh, how should you call it? Should you be defining it in opposition to solutionism? Should you be defining it in opposition to something else? And, you know, and eventually I think a system which uh, gives people and uh, citizens the rights to flourish and become whoever they want and which treats them in a way that respects them, that gives them access to all the possible infrastructures of becoming, this is deserves the name of socialism. So I see no problem in kind of salvaging and saving that term 
from the kind of rather boring meaning that it acquired now where it's about having some kind of a welfare state and taxes that are being paid and shuffled across different you know domains and industries i mean for me yes socialism would require that but it would require going back to its initial idea and its original idea of essentially providing uh, meaningful interactions and chances for growth and socialization and sociality among people so that they can pursue their own life projects outside of uh, demands and constraints imposed on them uh, from the outside, whether it's by the logic of the market or by something else. So in that sense, uh, socialism is not a bad organizing uh, slogan. The question then is how we would like to qualify it. Should we qualify it as digital socialism, as platform socialism, as uh, some kind of uh, you know, cyber socialism. I mean, those are questions that are to be answered. I answered them in the book, but I, I'm not. I'm not going to give you uh, the the arch concept. I mean, that arch concept will have to wait until the book is out. Uh, but uh, beyond that, coming back to a question, how it will be implemented? Uh, well, I think it will have to be implemented as a political project. So it will require political parties that will either recognize that this is what socialism today means, and it will have to be parties that have traditionally fought for it, or it has to be a completely different set of parties that will basically say, okay, the parties that we have, they're not delivering on it, and we would like to give our citizens the chance to basically flourish and to cooperate and to maybe save themselves from the climate catastrophe uh, by unleashing all the man's uh, uh, creativity and power that is uh, present and inherent uh, in these communities, right? And it could be that the Green Parties would be adequate for it. It could be that it will be a very different mix of uh, kind of socialist, green, ecological parties. But, you know, ultimately, we will have to push the logic of the market to its ultimate consequences. We have to understand that these boutique design markets that I've described in my lecture, they do represent the most advanced vision of where the neoliberal system would be. And we have to understand that, uh, you know, perhaps central planning is not the most, even if we can make it work with central, with big data and algorithms, perhaps that is not the best of what we can do with digital technology. So we have to think harder, but then eventually, yes, we'll need to implement it through parliaments and the parliamentary system. And uh, alas, uh, I don't see how else you'll implement something so ambitious. Uh, I think this question and your response uh, connects already with several of the questions that we get from the viewers. Uh, but let me pass one on to you and let's see if you can say anything additional to, 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 to the question of Jaap Henk. Um, and he's asking, what kind of infrastructures and institutions do you believe are necessary to use altruism or solidarity as a basis for development of new knowledge and innovation? And can you give specific examples and general approaches these examples inspire? Sure. Um, well, I mean, look, a lot of these acts of solidarity and altruism, as I tried to make clear in my lecture, they're already present in our life. So in that sense, our everyday collective life is pregnant with these acts. We just don't notice them. So every time we interact with our neighbors, with each other, with our friends, on terms that do not presuppose us running some kind of auction to determine who's going to do what, and we uh, collaborate with each other because we think that that's just the right thing to do, we expect that, uh, you know, perhaps this is what good behavior uh, is all about, we engage in those acts. I think the problem uh, in, in a lot of kind of leftist circles, you know, people who have been thinking about solidarity economy, or who have been thinking about some kind of a, you know, non-market economy, is that they never thought of applying a system uh, as sophisticated as capital or capitalism to this acts of solidarity and rebellion so that every single act that we engage in is productive as system-wide transformations, right? That's also what I tried to somewhat explain in the talk. I mean, for me, it's essential that this acts of everyday self-help or everyday community help or whatever, they, they do not just reside isolated in that little reservoir of the community, but through feedback infrastructures, through some kind of, you know, perhaps even social point system. And I know that here I might sound like advocating, you know, Chinese social credit system, but I wouldn't discount it out of, out of the blue. I mean, I know it might sound horrible to like an average Dutch, uh, you know, liberal citizen, but there is something in the idea that our behavior 
behaviors and acts uh, might be uh, sort of uh, rewarded uh, with uh, certain uh, community currencies, if you will, right? Depending on what goals and objectives communities have set on themselves. And anybody who finds it draconian, they just don't understand how capitalism works, that capitalism rewards and punishes you uh, just like that. And this is exactly what Hayek means uh, when he talks about uh, the forces of competition and the market uh, exercising impersonal compulsion over you, right? So I think we have to think harder, and this is why I think uh, we cannot ignore surrendering control over what in my earlier works uh, and essays uh, I've called digital or feedback infrastructures, right? It's this kind of systems which enable communities to organize collective action within themselves, but it's also something that allows to redistribute uh, rewards, attention, credit, etc., within and between their members. So I would be looking at examples of how existing communities uh, self-organize, how they rely on various reputation systems to redistribute, you know, uh, rewards and redistribute essentially credit, uh, including non-monetary credit. But I think beyond that, we need to think what can this uh, local reputation systems mean in the global context and how do you scale them up? Because it's because we have, you know, a monetary system uh, with everything essentially being made equivalent to each other that under capitalism, uh, even the smallest acts of participation in the economic system have system-wide effects. And without thinking what would this uh, equivalent of this general equivalent system of money be, in a non-capitalist system and what role can information and feedback systems play in it without posing that question i think we wouldn't move very very uh, far and you know and that's why i'm kind of uh, very cautious of not giving you easy answers with examples of you know local communities in barcelona or amsterdam or somewhere in latin america doing cool things because ultimately those still remain this locally trapped experiments which have some therapeutic effect on those who participate in it, and they might perhaps address some tiny local problems so they make life easier and more livable, but they don't have those broader system transforming effects. And it's precisely to have them that we require smarter strategy about feedback infrastructures and digital infrastructures in general. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, tap, uh, tap into a bit more into this um, uh, system change that you, that you just mentioned and uh, how citizens, uh, citizen initiatives uh, would relate to governments and, and political levels. I mean, where does it start? Do we, uh, where can these changes be made? Um, should we start and inspire uh, uh, changes on a small scale, initiatives on a short, small scale, uh, or is it the government and politicians that should take a lead? How do you see this uh, developing and these two interacting? Well, you know, this is where you can see that I'm a, I'm a deep Leninist at heart. I think that the real job is of political parties and sort of intellectuals with them. It's not necessarily of politicians, right? So I'm not talking about elected politicians who sit in the European Commission or who sit in national capitals, right? I really think that here it's a question of political parties representing certain strata of society, formulating these issues in appropriate terms and uh, formulating strategy. And, you know, of course, it doesn't mean that we need to go back to this Leninist top-down, you know, political party system. But I think it's uh, essential to have this kind of intermediaries and it's essential to have institutions that think about these things on a regular basis and that try to strategize and try to seek insight from elsewhere, from other contexts, etc. I mean, citizens, of course, should still play an important role in it. And I think we shouldn't discourage uh, people participating in formulating these agendas. And I think the more citizens can pressure existing parties to shift their line and to you know, understand that capitalism that is presented to us as essentially emancipatory and free and cost-free and something that can solve all of our issues, we should be able to push our politicians to stop uh, giving us this propaganda uh, talking points and to engage uh, with its real costs, right? And to face the real cost of it and to understand that for all the good things that capitalism does, it also ties our hands, it ties our creativity, it uh, imposes 
imposes certain ideological blinkers on our eyesight, right? And we have to make sure that people can't get away with just celebrating at one side and not celebrating the other. And this is where I think pressure from citizen groups, NGOs, activists, uh, student movements, all of that can be helpful, but it cannot substitute for critical strategy tied to a somewhat different reading of what an alternative be, right? And I think an alternative cannot be defined in the terms that capitalism itself supplies to us. It cannot be defined as green capitalism or timber capitalism or, you know, I don't know, uh, privacy uh, friendly capitalism, right? It has to be something else, ideally. And to formulate that something else, it requires more than just a bunch of English citizens acting together. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I hope that also covered a bit uh, the question of one of the viewers, Timo, uh, which is, was basically about this. Uh, um, I have um, uh, another question, which is about this uh, library model that you introduced okay. um, uh, and connecting that with the utilities model. And you've been very critical about that, um, amongst others, in an article in The Guardian, uh, 2019. Uh, where you point out the main differences between uh, utilities uh, and, um, and information, data, uh, pointing out that data lends itself uh, for, uh, to a multiplicity of interpretation and action plans. So that's like, a, a, I think, a clear difference. Um, I would like to add to that another difference that uh, in the data economy, uh, it's not the data just that we receive and that we maybe pay for, but also the data that we give and is sold for us or is sold on these platforms. So um, how do you see that um, the critics, the, the, the criticism that you have yourself to the utilities model, how do you see that uh, applied to the library model that you introduced in your lecture? Sure, but for me, the library model is an example of some kind of very clever political institutional hack that, uh, you know, basically circumvents existing laws and regulations in order to achieve a socially recognized political goal, right? So in that sense, for me, uh, the library is just an example of things that we forgot how to do. And uh, we only do them technologically now. So, you know, because we have lost face in the ability of uh, the law to deliver on this emancipatory agenda. So the only face we have is in the power of technology. And that explains to you why something like blockchain or Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general acquires such a messianic uh, interpretation. Because the idea there, of course, is that, well, you know, it's written in the protocol. So in the protocol will take care of uh, the social mission. So you don't need to think about how to hack socially, politically, and legally existing institutions that will all happen with technology imposing its own law logic on reality, so to say. So, I mean, and it might be a useful, and, you know, I don't want to denigrate that. I mean, it's not just the world of crypto. I mean, to some extent, Wikileaks function on that model. To some extent, uh, Science Hub today functions on that model, right? It's the idea that the combination of certain technologies will have uh, irreversible political and social effects on society, and society will have to adapt to it. And, you know, there is a certain subversive logic to it, and I, I don't want to play it down. Uh, that said, uh, so for me, the library, it was not meant uh, in any way as, a, as an actual model of how things should be run. I mean, it was more like an example of how things can be hacked in ways that are not just technological. Uh, but beyond that, thinking about the utility model and the questions you asked about data as producing it, but also consuming it. I mean, um, look, all of it is true. But again, um, there are certain... Um, I mean, there are certain objective data points that I think we shouldn't uh, completely neglect. So, I mean, GPS, yes, you can probably imagine uh, a postmodernist take on GPS where, you know, or some kind of relativity theory, Einsteinian take on GPS where, you know, you will not be able to confidently say where you are and all these points will be inaccessible. But by and large, the way that GPS now works and the way in which, you know, Google Maps can identify your location and pinpoint you where you are, I mean, that sort of works objectively. And I see no reason why being developed with so much public money, why that has become a, a private function of a private company. And even though they offer it for free or in exchange for our data, it's still essentially got privatized. In a, in, in, in those cases where I think utility model to some extent might help us, but it, it, you don't have to treat it as a utility. You can treat it as 
sort of to, to think about it as infrastructure. And once you start thinking about it infrastructure, once you expand the notion of infrastructure to include also non-market institutions like libraries or museums, you end up uh, away from this idea that, ah, you know, we used to run electricity systems by having nationally run electricity companies with fixed rates, so we'll do the same with data. So, you know, my fear about the utility model is that it's gonna fix in place the system where we're just going to change labels on these companies, but the companies will stay in place and everything else will stay in place, only that they will pay less or they will pay more, et cetera. I mean, that's what I want to avoid. And for me, there is some kind of institutional conservatism uh, at the heart of the utility model if uh, utility, if the notion of the utility is not stretched to include institutions like uh, libraries, museums, et cetera, not just companies. Mm -hmm. Um, as already uh, stated in the introduction, we'll, we'll close the event with an uh, informal talk in the rooftop bar uh, with Yevgeny also. But before we go there, I would like to address uh, one last uh, topic, and that's the, the syllabus, the project that you are working on now. Um, uh, could you explain it a bit? Uh, but also I'm very interested in how you see uh, the syllabus, maybe your motivations to do the project, in relationship to this idea of democratization of knowledge. And yes. from my perspective, also how we now have seen the downside of this democratization uh, with platforms where um, people get information but cannot discern information from conspiracy theories, from, from fake bullshit. Um, so information has become freely accessible to anyone. The curation of information has been kind of scrutinized and criticized as being elitist. Um, how do you see this and to which extent is the syllabus like a new gatekeeper, gatekeeper to knowledge or how would you avoid becoming a new gatekeeper to knowledge? Please tell us all about the syllabus and how you look at these right. topics that I just addressed. Well, first of all, I see no problem as being a gatekeeper to knowledge. I mean, what's so bad about being a gatekeeper? I mean, uh, you can be also a gatekeeper to a pile of shit, you know, so you're preventing people from drowning in it. So, I mean, I think we shouldn't underestimate the, the charms of uh, gatekeeping. I mean, sometimes it's nice to keep the doors closed. But, you know, apart from that, uh, you know, my initial motivation for the syllabus, I mean, it has multiple dimensions, but uh, it has to do with me noticing that, uh, you know, there is some kind of e idiocracy built into the digital economy where the content that we consume gets dumber and dumber uh, because the algorithms uh, recommend us things that we've already watched or they know that they're going to extract more revenue from us by giving us things that we have liked and that essentially leads to very suboptimal uh, curatorial choices where we are not pointing towards content that's actually of high quality, highly relevant, it already exists online but maybe it doesn't fit our profile or maybe it's not yet been associated with our needs and desires so maybe it's just something against which it's very hard to sell advertising and to me it was obvious that the existing logic of the digital economy is not going to bring that content to the fore so and it was also obvious to me that uh, you know there needs to be some intervention into the market for attention if you will so that we can channel some attention towards content that's actually highly relevant and highly interesting but is overlooked and uh, you know it was also obvious to me that the current digital economy is completely is, is built on a completely bizarre set of principles where you know a couple of platforms have dominated the uh, aggregation indexing and consumption of uh, information uh, and in order to compete with them uh, you need to either or at least that's what we are told by our governments you either need to have billions of dollars in funding or you need to somehow uh, you know take huge risks and I think it's kind of not true. So, you know, I wanted to show governments and existing public institutions that they're mistaken, that you can start with a small pot of money and that you can essentially do a better job curating the very resources that Google and YouTube and others index. And, you know, we, for example, uh, I, mean, I can tell you what it is. We essentially, every week we find more than 1,000 high quality items in six languages from podcasts to videos to academic articles to journalism to reports to books. And we send them to our our subscribers and they can personalize their own syllabus they can get from five to ten topics uh, and uh, it all arrives every week and as I said in multiple languages and the idea there is that we can do a better job 
uh, free riding on some of the infrastructures built by Google and Facebook and Twitter and, 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 and essentially offer an essential service to people that, in my opinion, there should be a thousand projects like the syllabus and the infrastructure in which we free ride should not be there. We don't free ride it. We pay huge bills to Google and Amazon, but still, you know, we are kind of free riding on it because it's theirs. But instead of being theirs, it should be turned into a public infrastructure in which all the other players who do not have the money that we poured into the syllabus from our own pockets, who don't want to take the risks of running a site that might fail and might not have enough users, but people who have good ideas, you know, who think that they can organize all this uh, materials that exist on Google and YouTube and Facebook better, they should be allowed to come in and do it. Right? And right now they can't. And unfortunately, all these apps that have sprung up around Play Store and App Store and whatnot, they don't allow you to actually get to the core of things. And those core services remain with the firms themselves. And I think that the sooner we can essentially think about how much we are under innovating by not letting institutions like the syllabus to even appear because it's too risky and not everybody wants to be a startup and not everybody can afford to be a well-funded NGO. You know, the sooner we can make it clear, the sooner we'll right, arrive to the right policy mix where these things will be treated as public infrastructures. Super, thanks. Uh, let's all invite uh, uh, people to go to the syllabus, subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, one, last, one last question. Uh, you didn't want to say too much about your new book, but can you reveal the title to us? Well, the title, we've chosen it many, many years ago, and I still think we're still sticking to it. I won't give you the subtitle, but the title is still Freedom as a Service. Okay, okay. Um, thanks, Yevgeny. Thanks a lot for being with us. Uh, we invite you also to take the elevator in our portal, planet.impact.nl, to go to the rooftop bar. That's a Zoom environment uh, where we'll have an informal chat. And uh, Yevgeny, you can join us for a few minutes. You've just announced, uh, announced. So let's see you at the other side. Thanks, audience. Thanks for watching. And we hope to see you soon again at an Impact Online event. Thanks. Thank you.